Harboring suspicion and mistrust will eventually poison, is the word there. Harboring suspicion and mistrust will eventually poison the culture of your organization. This is kind of gross. Letter A. There are things that grow and multiply in the darkness, and there are things that grow and multiply in the light, right? Other than carrots and potatoes, can you think of anything that grows and multiplies in the darkness that you'd want to eat? I mean, when you flip over a rock, you're not looking for something to eat. You kind of jump back in case there's something under it, right? Things that grow and multiply in the darkness are generally not good things. Things that grow and multiply in the light are. Number one, the things that grow in the darkness can't survive direct sunlight. Things that grow in the dark are generally unhealthy. So consequently, so consequently, let her be. When you choose not to trust, when you choose not to trust and refuse to confront your concealed suspicion, your concealed suspicion grows and poisons your attitude. See, suspicion is like something under a rock. Suspicion is like something under, you know, a piece of plywood that's laid out in the backyard for too long. Suspicion is something that grows on the inside of you and eventually spills over into your conversation about those people. Suspicion is never, never a good thing to carry around. There's not one good thing that comes from carrying suspicion around in organizational life. To finish that, your attitudes, this is huge, and I've learned this the hard way. Your attitudes about the people in your organization are telegraphed. People no. People, no. My leadership team knows the people that I have a hard time trusting, and I've never told them. I've never told them at a list. And by the way, just to make sure you all know these people in the organization I have a hard time trusting. But you ask them. I've never asked them. I'm t- it's too, I, I, but if you ask them, they tell you, you know what, high trust, pretty high trust. How do they know? Because I'm telling you, I don't care how careful and smart you are, your attitudes get telegraphed through the people that work directly with you. And suspect Suspicion and a lack of trust gets telegraphed. People know. It's not really a secret. You've never talked about it, but it's not really a secret. And the longer you carry the secret, the more it grows and the uglier it grows. And then by the time you're ready to talk about it, you talk about it with a little bit too much energy. Let her see. (laughs) That's just a nice way of saying you're just mad. Let her see. The consequences. This, this, This. Let me look up here a second. Okay. I know this is a whole lot. See, in church world, we, we got our values so screwed up. We have confused sensitivity with dishonesty, okay? We think we're being sensitive, we're being dishonest. We think we're being kind, we're just not being truthful. If you're carrying and harboring suspicion about somebody that works with you on your staff and you've never talked to them because you're trying to be sensitive, you're not being sensitive, you're being dishonest. You are poisoning your culture because that stuff gets telegraphed. It just does. And things that are brought out into the light generally lose their power and they lose their ability to hurt your culture. Number one, the consequences of confrontation are tangible. Excuse me, letter C. The consequences of confrontation are far less severe, is the word there, sorry. The consequences of confrontation are far less severe than the consequences of concealment. We think it's the opposite. We think that by keeping it concealed, that you know, if I talk to her about it, that she's going to blow up. If I talk to him about it, he's liable to quit. We're so afraid of the consequences of being that transparent. But the consequences of concealment are far worse because that's what poisons your culture. Honest confrontation doesn't poison a culture. Transparency about what happened and didn't happen doesn't poison your culture. It's awkward. People cry. People lose their temper. People go home early. You know, I mean, there's, it's lots of emotion. And some of you, that just stuff kind of scares you to death and confrontation freaks you out. But the consequences of that are far, far, far less severe than I'm just going to carry around my suspicion. Because unconcealed suspicion is poison to your soul and it gets telegraphed in the organization. Number one, the consequences of confrontation are tangible, immediate, and impact only a few relationships. The consequences of confrontation are tangible. You see it. They're immediate. We had that conversation and they impact only a few relationships. Number two, but the consequences of concealment are intangible. This is why you have interviewed with churches and on church staffs, and you just go, there's just something wrong there. It's intangible. Listen, it's like something that's rotten in your disposal, and you, you just, ugh, it's just in there. That needs to go. You don't know what it is. You just know it's bad, right? And you can flip a switch, right? But in church world, you just go, oh, that's bad. I, I just don't want to work there, right? Or now you're on staff and they, you know, the interview that was just like, you know, next to heaven working here, right? And then you got there 
It's like, well, this is bad, and you can't put your finger on it. Listen, it's that intangible, I don't know where it's coming from, odor of somebody carrying around something dead and rotten that hasn't been exposed to the light. The consequence, number two, of concealment are intangible, long-lasting, and they can impact every relationship in your organization. The consequences of concealment are intangible, long-lasting, and they'll imp can impact every relationship in your organization. I wrote in my notes, the longer you wait, the madder you'll be, and when things are eventually confronted, you may over-communicate. <laughs> Anybody here ever over-communicate? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. All right, letter D. As leaders, we must learn, and that's the key word there, as leaders, we must learn to fear the consequences of concealment more than the transparency of a culture built around trust. Last page, conclusion. Listen to this. You've preached on this passage. Do you have this in your notes, the Matthew passage in there? Yeah. Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar, and first... Go and be reconciled to your brother. Then come and offer your gift. In other words, before you worship, make things right with your brother. <laughs> we don't just worship. We're the ones who create the environment for worship. Right? Whether it's kids or adults. We're not just worshipers. We create the environment. We lead worship. If this verse is relevant for somebody who's just coming to church and mad as heck is the guy, you know, and then, then the Bible says, okay, before I come in there and worship, I got to go make it right. If this, is, if this verse is relevant for just random people out in society who have something against somebody, what about a church staff? I mean, can we sincerely and authentically create, you know, incredible, you know, relevant, in, you know, irresistible environments of worship? When we have something, not just against our brother out there in the neighborhood association, because, you know, he wanted to build a pool in the front yard, and we're like, oh, I can't do that, I'm not a big deal, but I go to your church, and, you know, all that kind of stuff, you know. It, it, or he, she fired, he fired your daughter, but, you know, he's a deacon, and you can't fire the pastor's daughter, you know, all those things. We, oh, come on. If, if we work on a church staff together, and we have something against each other, and we're concealing it, and we don't want to talk about it, and we talk to other people about it, but not them, I mean... Is that any kind of invitation for God to bless what we're doing or to be a part of what we're doing? I don't think so. You don't think so. We know better. So the beginning, the beginning of great staff, the beginning of great culture is making these two decisions. I'm going to choose to trust you. And I'm going to choose to be trustworthy. And when there's a gap, you'll hear about it from me before you hear about it from anybody else. And when what you experience is not what you expected, hey, we're going to have a conversation and I'm inviting you to come talk to me. In fact, please don't sit on it. Please don't bury it. Please don't talk to us. Just, let's just have that commitment. Let's just have that decision between the two of us. Years ago, um, Randy Pope came and spoke to a staff at a, at a staff meeting. And he said this. Randy is at Perimeter Church not too far from here. And I love Randy. He's been a mentor to me for years. He said this to our, our, had a little group of staff. He asked this question. He said, are the relationships around this table... Are the relationships around this table worth exporting to the rest of the congregation? That's a good question. Are the health and the nature of these relationships, is what's going on between you as staff members, is this what you want going on between the people in your congregation? And if you've embraced trust and trustworthiness as a core value on your staff, then the answer is yes, because you can pretty much survive anything if that's the case. So at the end of your notes, I wrote a few... Uh, questions for evaluation and then after we do this we're going to go into a time of communion where we can really evaluate here's the questions number one are there people in your organization you have a difficult time trusting are there people in your organization on your staff you have a difficult time trusting and number two is it your issue or theirs do you need to look in the mirror before you look out the window is this your issue or theirs? And let me tell you what the answer to that question is, even though I don't know you or them. The answer is it's probably a little bit of both. It's a little bit of your background, and it's a little bit about, you know what, you didn't confront them the first time, and you didn't confront them the second time. In fact, you've never even really confronted them. You just don't trust them. You've never even, 
you've never even really had the conversation, but you're harboring mistrusting, that's a little bit of you, as well as maybe being a little bit of them. Number three, what can you, what can you do about your part? What can you do about your part of the equation? Because you see, the, the temptation is to say, I need to go sit down and, and tell them, I just don't trust you. But, what, but, but what, before we do that, good leaders don't do that. First, you've got to own your percentage of the problem. And maybe the only percentage you can own is, you know what? I should have come to you the first time, and I just got too busy. I should have come to you the second time, but I thought, well, my, you're a completely untrustworthy person, but you know what? My part of the equation is I didn't respond immediately. Because come on, we're leaders, and we're busy, and it's just going to work itself out somehow. Number four, what do you need to address with them about their part? In other words, what's the part that you need to talk to them about? Number five, who do you sense has a difficult time trusting you? Who do you sense on your staff has a difficult time trusting you? Why? And what can you do about it? I'm just telling you. I think if we could get this right as church cultures, contemporary, traditional, bright, dim, quiet, emergent, uh, you know, you know what? I, I'm just convinced of this. Outsiders, unbelievers, unchurched people would, would get amongst us and they go, I want that kind of relationship. I would love to work there. I would love for my wife to work there. How I wish we could create that kind of culture where I'm, I'm just telling you, if we could just get this right. And again, I don't think this is 401 or 501. This is just basically love one another. Oh, brilliant idea. Who said that, you know? Let me close with reading you this. This is in my notes. It's not in your notes. And, then we'll, and this is just what I wrote. We're a group of imperfect people who've been selected by God for a very important enterprise. Our success does not hinge on our perfection. We can survive mistakes. We can survive bad decisions. But we cannot survive a culture that is void of trust.